Hello everyone, I'm D-Mind, the mind of one and all, and welcome back to another episode of An Octave Higher. So in the last episode, we switched perspective yet again from that, from Frederick. Yeah, I remember his name, Frederick. Um, the social player, the aristocratic social player, to this girl who he's now in love with, apparently. Yeah, and so she's a factory worker. Yeah, we're going to work right now. Uh, before long, I see the omnibus arriving. I get on the floating platform. Actually, sometimes I still find the omnibus scary. The platform wobbles every time someone steps on it, and also I feel much lighter than normal after I get on. And I always worry about what will happen if the driver suddenly ran out of mana. I don't think that will happen, but I mean, yeah, it could. I know that's a silly thought. The burglars. Wait, the Borgios never run out of mana like we pros do, but still, the air outside the omnibus shifts all of a sudden and we're carried forward. In a few seconds, the omnibus starts to pick up speed. After making a few stops to pick up and drop off passengers, the omnibus reaches its an intersection, where it should turn left towards the factory. However, I noticed that the, that, that street is closed today. There are some government workers there. They look like they are installing a new magic machine. The omnibus makes a right turn instead. Oh, we're taking a detour through the city center. I haven't seen this part of the city in such a long time. Everyone outside my window, everything outside my window is so shiny. Even at, at noon, the places where we post live never look like this. The center of Overture is like a place out of a fairy tale. Huge, high buildings that you have to strain to see the tops off, and even taller towers pierce high into the sky. I'm captivated by it all. Even the sidewalks are beautiful to me. I see some people flying in their own private carriages instead of taking the omnibus, and they're all wearing really beautiful dresses. Even the people who are walking down the street look classy. I also notice a lot of police officers. There's at least one of them in, on every street corner. That makes sense, since everyone is capable of using magic in the city. The police ha have to be around to deal with anyone who misuses magic. The omnibus pulls up to another stop. Some passengers get off while new passengers get on the platform. The omnibus sways as it tries to compensate for the shifting weight. My stomach doesn't like this at all. Oh, it's um... Uh, I can't remember their names, but... I remember his last name though, Byron. <laughs> And her last name, Blyton. <laughs> yeah, of course you have to look it up. Not look it up, look back and see whether their names were similar. Among the new passengers, there's a young boy and a young girl who look slightly older than me. From their uniforms, I guess they're students. The two teenagers sit next to each other. Ah, alright. So, I think I figured it out. When they show that animation, the character, like, just appear and then goes away and then the character like fades into you, that's when we switch perspective. So just now we just switch perspective from the girl back to the student. Alright, cool. Rita and I are taking our usual omnibus, but there is something unusual about it this morning. What with this omnibus? Well the driver is nullifying a bit too much gravity, but is that a problem? Not that. I was usually I was talking about the unusually large number of pros. Oh, that. The factory workers usually get off before our stop, but the main factory road is closed today. I heard they're installing a new drinking fountain. Didn't you read the news? Did you read that in the Overture Science Journal? No. Then I must not have read it. Nerd. We enjoyed the commute in silence for a while, feeling the cool breeze coming from the front of the omnibus. Rita, you mentioned nullifying gravity, right? Uh-huh. Before omnibuses were made as magic machines, they were once driven by controlling the surrounding air, weren't they? Yes, but it was more difficult to steer because an omnibus was heavy. The driver had to have a strong faith to move an omnibus around. On the other hand, nullifying some gravity allows an omnibus to be almost as light as a personal carriage, even though it is much bigger. So why didn't traditional omnibuses use the same method as today's omnibuses? Because the driver would have had to be really skilled in both faith and willpower magic. 
It's not a problem now because anyone can operate magic machines even though they're not skilled in the in the requisite traits. Uh another well it's not that much of an exposition, but again. For example, you're not gifted in courage, but you can use your stove at home, right? Hmm interesting. Actually I always wonder about that. Why can I use my stove even though I'm not gifted in courage? <laughs> Earth's eyes flare up. As a magical engineering student, she must like the topic. You know how fire is cast, of course? Well, of course, fire equals summon courage. That's very basic. Right. When you cast fire, you actually perform these separate acts. First, you focus on the courage trait. What actually happens is that a little bit of the mana in your body is infused with courage. You're gonna teach me this again. Second, you invoke the summon ability. What actually happens here is that your body consumes the courage infused mana to summon the fire. And it's only then, third, that you release the magic from your hand. Arita pauses to make sure I understand. You know what, I never really think of these steps when casting a spell because they're done unconsciously. But I remember learning about this in IMS. You mean introduction to magical suffering, right? Evidently, she remembers how I used to complain about IMS. Anyway, what your stove at home does is the second and third steps. It summons fire using courage infused mana and releases the magic. But machines can't do the first step. That's what you're touching the stove and focusing on courage is for. When you touch the stove and focus on courage, your body infuses courage into a portion of your mana. And then that courage infused mana flows into the stove. Alright, so now we learn how magic machines work. And then the stove can perform the second and third steps automatically. I stroke my chin. I've learned this before, I'm sure, but it's good to be reminded of how magic machinery works. In a very real sense, it's the basis of our modern world. So basically, a magic machine takes mana that already infuses one or more magical traits by a human, and then invokes magical abilities using that mana. In other words, a machine is just a way to automate the process of invoking summon, amplify, nullify, transform, or any combination of these magical abilities. Huh. Yeah, I think I get it. Being gifted in a magical trait means you have natural talent to invoke magical abilities on that particular magical magical trait. Ha! <sighs> but even if you are not gifted in a trait, you can still infuse your mana with that trait. You just can't easily invoke abilities using that mana. Oh, so anyone can use any of the elements but it's just harder to invoke the abilities like summon and amplify with it? Yeah, I guess that's what they mean. However, when you use a magic machine, you don't have to invoke any magical abilities because the magic machine does it for you. Therefore, it doesn't matter what magical traits you are gifted in. Bingo, my friends. So my friends is smart. Mommy is happy. <laughs> Sometimes she claims to be my lover, other times my elder sister. For some reason, today she is my mother. While Lovita is still laughing, our omnibus comes to a halt in front of the conservator. We get up from our seats and step off the omnibus. I take a look at the pose again as I get off the bus. A girl is gazing longingly at the conservator. At the conservator, I can feel a faint aura radiating from her. Courageous and compassionate. Oh, so that's your magic. Yeah, we've seen her use healing magic, so she has courage and compassion. I see. France, coming. From the omnibus stop, we saunter across the spacious conservatory courtyard. The courtyard is surrounded by three buildings on its east, west, and north sides, and is open to the street on the south. The omnibus stop is right across the street. If you drew a line from the omnibus stop to the north building's main entrance, the line would be parallel to the east and west buildings, and divide the courtyard into two rectangles of equal size. Do I need to know this? <laughs> like, okay, you just described the layout of the building. Well, I guess, fine. The north building is the main building and it's much larger than the other two. If someone tells you to go to the conservatory building without specifying which one, you can safely assume that he means the north building. It's just where most of your acad academic activities are conducted. So if you're looking for a classroom or a laboratory, that's where you should go. The west building, the smallest of the three, is for administrative purposes, which is why it's usually only crowded at the beginning of an academic year or right before graduation. The East Building is for everything else. It houses facilities that aren't directly related to magical science, 
and engineering such as the library, the art room, and various club rooms. Oh hey, it's already the weekend tomorrow, isn't it? Tomorrow is light day, so yes indeed. What's light day? Do you have any plans? Um, no. Then let's go see a kinet kinetoscope show. What's a kinetoscope show? Okay, he's gonna explain it to me now. Kinetoscope is a relatively modern magic machine invention. It makes pictures move. Oh, a movie. It's like watching a play, but there are no actors on stage. Well, there's not even a stage. There's just a wall, and this machine projects images onto the wall from a long strip of individual pictures through shutter. Yes, you don't need to explain this. Apparently, it works by continuously running the strip of pictures over projecting light, and on and alternatively, and alternately opening and closing the shutter, which is controlled using the same wind magic as the one used to levitate a carriage or a nonibus, or to rotate the hour and minute hands of a chronometer. A magician operates the kinetoscope by casting illumination magic to produce the light required to project the images. It's really quite a fascinating little machine. A kinetoscope show, huh? You don't have anything to do tomorrow, right? It's not like you suddenly get a girlfriend today. Hey, it could happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> Fine, I'll go see a kinetoscope show with you tomorrow. Great, let's meet at the theatre at noon. Sure. Rita and I stopped walking when we reached the North Building's entrance. So, are you going to the conference hall tomorrow? I'll look for Professor Poe before that. Okay, good luck on your presentation. Uh, yeah. Hmm? Not feeling confident? <laughs> well, to be honest, no, not really. <laughs> Relax, Frank, I'll teach you a little magic charm. Whenever you get nervous, say my name three times in your heart. It'll make the nervousness, it'll make the nervousness go away. Wow, my first choice! And it doesn't, and it seems stupid. I should say. Let's save. Um, yeah, sh save here, sure. Try the magic charm. Rita, Rita, Rita. Huh? Why did you actually do it? Th that was obviously, ju obviously just a joke. And I said in your heart. But I wanted to see if it would work. So, did it? Are you blushing now? Oh, come on. Hmm, maybe. Ahaha. <laughs> I. I've got to go, bye. Hmm, was she blushing? That's not like her. I don't open if I load. Um, let's load back. Um, don't try the child. Yeah, I'm sure saying your name would chase away my nervousness, only to be replaced by a paralyzing fear so that I can't speak or even move. Is that right? Oh yeah, you say my name and you'll stiffen right up. You won't be able to help yourself. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Rita. I think I prefer the second op, the first op option. Yeah. Alright. Hmm, I don't feel so nervous anymore though. Maybe the charm did work. There's still an hour before the symposium begins, but I already noticed many unfamiliar faces and uniforms among the people in the main hall. There are attendees from institutions outside the conservatoire. I head straight to the magic systems laboratory. Is that Professor Poe? He looks so... His face looks really square, for one. Two... He looks less detailed than like our main characters. Oh well. In the lab, Professor Poe is standing near a small floating ball of water, about as wide as my palm. His hand... His left hand is pointed at the floor under the ball of water. Good morning, friends. Mind your step, there is a zero gravity space in front of me. Good morning, Professor. What are you doing? Watch. Keeping his left hand pointed at the floor, he uses his right hand to pick up some green tea leaves from his desk and slip them inside the ball of water. Next, he brings his right hand and a few, a few inches under the ball and opens his palm. Summon courage. He's boiling tea. Come on. A small fire appears above his hand and heating the ball of water. The water gradually turns green because of the tea leaves inside. Just a few seconds later, Professor Poe closes his hand to extinguish the fire. He now picks up a mug from his desk and brings it directly under the ball of tea. With a sudden flare, he pulls his left hand up, 
releasing the spell and the ball of tea plops perfectly into the mug. Phew. He turns to me and wags his eyebrow up and down as he takes a sip of tea. Ready for the symposium, young man? Wait a minute, what were you doing? As you could see, I was experimenting. He swirls his tea in my direction to remind me. And I'm happy to report that experiment was a success. Well, I wouldn't call it an experiment, all you did was make tea. Wrong, friends. What I did was try out a novel way of making tea. Why? We already know how to make tea. Ho ho ho. Let me give you a life lesson. He takes another sip. Here's your secret to make your life inf infinitely more exciting. Whenever you find yourself about to ask why, stop and instead ask why not. Suppose someone said to you, let's make a carriage that doesn't only fly, but also spins in the air. Your first instinct might be to ask why. Because you know that flying straight should be easier and more efficient. But that is not a reason not to make a spinning carriage. It is merely a reason to make a carriage that flies straight. No one will stop you if you want to build a spinning carriage because why not? The day we are stop asking why not will be the day we stop innovating. Which may also be well the day we stop advancing as a civilization. Um, I guess I can see some of your point but... The implications of why is because in what practical use we could use it. Like, when we invented the carriage, you say, why we want the carriage? So we can transport people easier, faster, and a lot of people at once. You know, just saying. If you make spinning carriage, why is the why are you gonna use it for? Barely much, I think. The breath of human knowledge is an accumulation of acting upon the why nots. Hmm. Professor Paul calmly drinks his tea again. How do you make a spinning carriage? Ho oh, oh, ho oh, oh. ho I'll show you someday. I'm not sure I want to know. I think I get nauseous. Maybe it could be used as your like a carnival, right? But other than that, there's no practical purposes for it, I would think. Yeah, I'm ready for the symposium. Very good, let's go. He gulps down the rest of his tea and we're off. With Professor Paul walking beside me, the unfamiliar faces that 10 minutes ago never bothered looking in my direction now try to approach us just to greet and exchange handshakes with the professor. Everybody seems to recognize you. Oh well, I've worked with lots of institutions over the years. In fact, Professor Poe is all but a celebrity in research circles. When he was young, if you said this in front of the professor, he quipped that he was still young at heart. Professor Poe successfully solved one of the many long-standing mysteries of magic. His research answered the question of how the water, fire, rocks, and the wind that magicians summons are made of elements that already exist in nature. So, for example, when we cast water, the water is summoned from a nearby sea. Oh, really? It's not just out of thin air, just you pull it from the sea. Eventually, it finds its way back to the sea. Nothing is gained and nothing is lost. Yeah, I would think that, because if you can just make water appear, then you basically solve like clean water problem because you can just create clean water just like that but no you actually summon it from the sea so if there's no water in the sea let's say it all evaporated and it's all gone you can't summon water magic anymore most people are familiar with his books on the subject if not his name the title of is when magic comes when magic comes with the magic goes or why overture isn't drowned in a giant flood after three centuries of casting water spells it looks like many people from the industry are attending this year. Yes, MM alone is sending out a hundred representatives. MM? Magical Machinery? Magical Mechanical? What other MM would attend a science conference? Well, fair enough. At home, I always see those two letters printed on my coffee machine. At the conservatory, I read it on the lab equipment. In winter, I see it on my room heater. In summer, on the room cooler. All year long on my chronometer. MM is short. Oh. MM short for Magical Mechanical is the largest ma magic machine manufacturer in Overture. Quite possibly in the world. There are factories not only in Overture but also in our colonies. Oh, so Overture has colonies now, huh? I wonder what the other con colonies are like. We arrive at the conference hall on the top floor which is already packed full with the symposium attendees. Just as we're entering the hall, we bump into a beautiful woman. 
Oh, Professor Poe. Why, if it isn't Dr. Alanis Blyton. How are you? Oh, her mother. I'm fine, I hope you are too. Ho ho ho, but of course. The woman returns the Professor's chuckle with a kind smile, and then her gaze shifts to me. Hi, Franz. Hi, Dr. Blyton. I didn't know you were, you'd be coming. I might be imagining this, but I feel her smile has turned seductive. What? Eh? But I wouldn't miss my cute friends presentation for the world. Like mother, like daughter. Oh, what a surprise. My student and Dr. Blyton are already acquainted with each other. I am friends with a daughter. Ho ho ho, I, I see. I've heard of that daughter of yours, Dr. Blyton. She's working on a very interesting project, I hear. I have nothing to do with her project. She came up with that on her own. I honestly don't see why the conservatoire keeps inviting me to the symposium, considering that I hardly do any work on magic these days. That is absolutely not true. Your work helps us understand the most important component of magic itself. Without saying anything, Dr. Blyton... Oh, wait. Without saying anything, Dr. Blyton just smiles at the professor's remark. The professor turns to me. Well, you'll be sitting with the top, with the other president, pre presenters, right? I'll be watching with the audience. You should be giving this presentation instead of me. Ho ho ho. I've had my fair share of that. Thank you very much. This year, I think I'll just relax and watch. Good luck, friends. They both grin as they start walking toward the front row to join the other professors. I head to the seats in front, reserved for presenters. Oh, it's... Frederick. Yes, I only remember your name. You know, actually I think I'm starting to warm up to your character. At first you're like, an aristocratic prick, but then... No, you're still an aristocratic prick, but you're like, our aristocratic prick. Like, yeah, I don't think you're a bad guy. At least so far. I think. I think I'm starting, yeah, I'm starting to warm up this to, to Frederick. Maybe I'll support this character. As I turn the corner, I almost run straight into a man. We both stop. Suddenly surprised. Ah, sorry. Hmm? He looks about my age. Is he a student from another conservatoire? But he's not wearing any uniform. Actually, from the way he's dressed, he may be an aristocrat, but I didn't see any other aristocrats. Yeah, what is he doing here? Also, you guys did met each other, but I guess you didn't look at each other enough to remember each other. Oh well, I guess there really are all kinds of people attending the symposium. But I have a nagging feeling about this man. Have I seen him somewhere before? And now we're Frederick. What the hell is this peasant doing just standing and staring at my face? Admiring my profile? Be gone! Hey, can you move? Ah, sorry. I'm surrounded by idiots. What? He's walking toward the front room. Is he presenting? He only looks my age. He's even wearing a goddamn uniform. They are even letting students present these days? I knew it. This symposium is a joke. I can't believe I'm here. I take a seat at the back at the same time. A woman who seems to be the MC goes up to the, po to the podium. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Conservatoire D Overture's 17th Annual Symposium. Yay. Applause from the audience, but not from me. Uh, I need to remember I'm this guy's voice. I accidentally switched to the other guy's voice earlier. Today, we have 15 amazing presenters who will be sharing their knowledge with us. We will have 8 presentations in the morning and the rest in the afternoon. 15? Did she say 15? God save me. My father makes me attend this symposium every year. He says it's a good opportunity for me to experience the work of the greatest creative minds in the city first half. Since I'm home school and don't otherwise get to interact with academ academics, as the biggest shareholder in Magical Mechanical, it was easy for my father to make MM send me as one of their representatives. And it was equally easy for MM to send as many representatives as they wanted, them being the corporate sponsor of this event. Damn this luck. But before that, I'd like to call the headmaster of Conservatoire de Overture, Mr. But seriously, this symposium is a joke. Those presenters are not even here to share knowledge. They're either trying to sell something or get funding for their research. They're fakes. All of them. Oh, come on. Don't judge them. Applause again. Some old geezy goes up on the podium. The conference hall is pretty big. If you drew a hexagon on the floor, you could probably play soccer 
Sasha here. There wouldn't be any space left for an audience, though. Not that I would mind. Looks like there are exits to some kind of balcony outside from which one is able to look down at the courtyard. Another round of applause, the old geezer leaves the podium. Without further ado, please welcome our first presenter, a professor from the Academy of... Ha, <sighs> so tired. The walk back to the city from Mason de Beauvoir took over an hour. Even after I got back to civilization, I couldn't find where I was exactly. Eventually, I gave up and called a taxi carriage. Why didn't you just do that in the beginning? But unbelievably, the driver was a dolt. He didn't if he didn't know where the House of Lord Godwin was. I had to force him to pull over so that I could hail yet another taxi. I didn't get home until, well, after midnight. And now my eyelids feel heavy. Heavy. And he falls asleep. Heavy. And we are no longer him. Well, and we're back to the go. I think they're, ch they're changing perspective too frequently. Hey, hey, wake up. Hmm? Alice, wake up. Lunch break's almost over. A girl dressed in the same factory uniform as mine is shaking my body. I peek, I peek up at her without lifting my head, which is resting on my arms as I'm sitting clumped over a desk. Hey Jude, are you awake? Not sure. Do I look awake? Hmm, I say so. What with us having a conversation and all. I get up and stretch my arms. Half awake, maybe. That's good enough to work though. You guys look... A bit similar. Nah, not that similar. Oh, that's right. I have to see Mr. Nelton. I leave June and head to my supervisor's office. I pause at the door and take a deep breath before knocking. Come in. Good afternoon, Mr. Nelton. What do you need? Uh, his tone is really cold. This isn't going to be easy. Um, I'm sorry sir, but I lost my mana potion. Can I get an extra bottle of potion? No. But, listen miss. Alice, Shelley, emplo Wait. Alice Shelley employee C15106. Listen Miss Shelley, the rules state that every worker receives a bottle in the morning and another at lunch break. He's totally disinterested in my explanation. He barely looks up from his desk as he talks to me. I have to make him willing to help me somehow. I suck in a chest full of air and prepare to use the cutest voice I can master. As far as I can tell from Mason, that means I have to just about squeal my request. Please, please, please give me another bottle of mana, please, please. The expression on Mr. Nilton's face doesn't change in the slightest. Well, that was totally embarrassing for me. Like I said, Miss Shelley, I can't give you another potion because that's against the rules. What did you say happened to the ones you had again? I drank the potion as soon as I got it in the morning, but lost the one from lunch break. I remember putting it beside the furnace, but I can't find it now. Why didn't you drink it right away? Well, I was... Wait! Mr. Nelton's eyes widened, he leaned forward and lowered his voice. Do you think someone took it? No, 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 I wouldn't think that. Mr. Nelton straightened his posture again and crossed his arms. His arms. So where's your potion? Ugh, he really doesn't want to give me... That bottle of mana, does he? Stingy! Cheapo! If it has come to this, I have no choice but to play my trump card. You should never underestimate a girl in desperation, Mr. Nailton. Why you want another mana, mana potion though? I guess you could... I mean, it's useful but... Yeah. I bow down my head and stare at my feet. I'm sorry, Mr. Nailton. I pause for a few seconds after speaking in a shaky voice. My boss's face is starting to soften up. He can sense that something is about to happen. At least, that's what I imagine his face is doing. I can't actually see it because I'm still looking down at the floor. When I look up again, I make the most doleful look I can. I stare right into his eyes, my eyelids glistening and my pupils dilated with longing eyebrows raised and tilted to the forehead. My lips half open as if about to let some words out but lacking courage to do so, and my cheeks pink in shame. Okay, I can't, I can't actually look at my own cheeks and as far as I know, I've never once blushed in my life. But pink is how I visualize them. I promise I'll work really hard today, please. My boss gets at me almost in disbelief. At last, at last he lowers his and shakes his head with his eyes closed. 
fine. But only this time, you hear? He rises from his chair, walks to a cabinet at the back of his office and opens it. From inside the cabinet, he fetches a vial of clear blue liquid. He walks back and hands me the vial. It takes me without the least hesitation and joy soon returns to my face. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Then, at his yes, yes, now go away hand gesture, I turn to the door, step outside his office, and slip the vial of mana potion inside a pocket on my work apron. I go back to my working spot, happy after successfully pulling off what the girls at Mason dubbed the male's induct inducement technique, first movement. I never asked them about any subsequent movements. In any case, I've got what I wanted. Time to get back to work. This factory produces tons of machinery, literally tons every day, from household appliances to machines for public utility. We have a section for just about everything. The section where I work, though, deals with what people call the boring stuff. Yeah, but I'm afraid we have to leave it off with the boring stuff. So, leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and follow me on Twitter at DMindGaming if you have enjoyed, and I hope to see you again in the next episode.